Welcome in to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast, the official podcast of your New Orleans Pelicans, a podcast dedicated to everything you need to know about the squad. Hear from players, coaches, broadcasters, and those who cover the NBA on a daily basis. It's time to flock up. The New Orleans Pelicans podcast starts right now. Hand it off to Zion, who lost it. Saves him from going backcourt. He got undercut. Now CJ, deep right wing three. Are you serious? Fuck a getter. He had to shoot it. The shot clock about to expire. And that was a mess of a possession. Smoothie King center logo right wing. Three possession game. Middleton for three. Brick City. That's going to do it. Herb the rebound. Dribble it out. 3 2 1. Listen to him. Listen to him. What a bounce back for your Pelicans who defeat the Milwaukee Bucks for the first time in overtime. It's been four in a row on the wrong side. That streak is kerflui here at a packed blender. Your final score the Pelicans 107. The Bucks 100. What a massive win. The Pelicans now 45 and 28 on the year. Will stick in fifth place. It's a home win. John, it's a clutch win for New Orleans. What a win by the Pelicans at the Blender 107-100 against the Milwaukee Bucks. You wanted Jonas, you got him. 17 points, 10 rebounds. You wanted Zion, 28 points. And some clutch free throws at the end. CJ at 25, Trey Murphy at 15, and more importantly, Jim Eichenhofer, NewOrleansPelicans.com is happy. That's the most important thing is as long as I'm happy, everybody can have a good night. Well, Jim, obviously one of the players that everyone's going to be talking about is Zion Williamson. Everyone wanted him to take over, take control, take ownership. Please give me the ball. Give him the ball. Somebody do something that has to do with Zion in the fourth quarter. What did we see? And I think you saw cooperation with give him the ball between not only his teammates of making sure that he touched it, but Zion, who definitely made a concerted effort to make sure that he was a lot more of a presence in the fourth quarter tonight. I like what he said in his postgame interview with Aaron Summers where he talked about how after the game Tuesday, it, it popped into his head, like, I have to demand the ball more. And Thursday's game, he put that into practice where he actually did you know, make sure that he was getting it. He had nine free throws attempts in the fourth quarter, and I think that was a huge reason why the Pelicans were able to, you know, put the Bucks away after Milwaukee had crept within four or five points. He was just a lot more aggressive. He didn't. He had zero shots. I believe it was the last six minutes of the game Tuesday against Oklahoma City. Um, just so much more of of a presence at the offensive end. Um, he was actually only two for two from the field in the fourth quarter, but you say, like, he only had two shots, but guess what? The reason he only had two shots because he had a million free throw attempts, and every time he put his head down and got to the rim, they were following him. So that was great to see and something I think that they can lean on to make, just make sure you get the best player the ball and let him – it doesn't have to be him scoring or shooting, but a lot of times with how much attention he draws, he can get open shots for other guys, and they need to be better in clutch time, and it was good to see them make a, a good first step in that direction tonight. But it was it was cool to see CJ and Jonas be such huge parts of of this win. Especially, I think Jonas was a big reason why they were able to get up by 18 in the first half, and then CJ and Zion were big parts of how they were able to close the game in the fourth quarter. I loved how in this game you saw certain things that give you that semblance and sense of what J.D., Todd, and Aaron kept mentioning during the game. Hey, maybe they paid attention at practice yesterday. Maybe they did learn their lessons. And look, we, we kind of chatted about this, whether it was the podcast on Wednesday, my talk show, what have you, where fans don't want to hear, right? Lessons and Graf kept saying in the broadcast, school's out. It's time to apply what you have learned. Mm -hmm. There were some instances that we saw that tonight, specifically in your mind, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I think... I liked what Zion said in his post-game interview with Aaron where he talked about how he, you know, he said after the game on Tuesday, I need to start demanding the ball. And tonight he said the same thing, but actually he went out and did it and was just so aggressive. So I think that was a, a big part of it. I mean, 
it is interesting to think about some of the issues that they've had in clutch time. And then you, you also factor in that the solution sometimes is very simple. That's just get the ball to the best player on the team, the guy that can draw double teams, that can get to the free throw line as much as he did. So I think that was one of the biggest things. Um, I thought the defense was so much better in the first half tonight compared to the first half against Oklahoma City as well. I mean, it was night and day. They gave up 73 points in the first half against OKC, and then Milwaukee only scores 45. So that was a big reason why they were able to get in, in the lead. This was kind of the, the opposite of the game Tuesday where you know they were down the vast majority of the game against the Thunder, but tonight they were in control and had the lead. And despite Giannis having that stretch in the third quarter, it looked like he was going to just – terrorize the entire city of New Orleans and dribble through <laughs> anyone in, in his way, yes. they were able to withstand yeah. that and get the victory. I, I would almost say what stood out to me late in that fourth quarter in clutch time when, when there was a, a string of possessions here that really stood out to me. It's one thing to have, I think, Jim Zion demand the ball and won it. I think to me the biggest thing was this. Zion layup, that's cool, is this. Zion free throw, Zion free throw, Herb three, Zion free throw, Zion free throw, CJ two-pointer, Zion free throw, Zion free throw. He's going to get fouled. And in the postseason, teams will foul him, especially if he doesn't hit the free throws. I know he missed six, but 10 of 16, man, that's, that's just as big as calling for the ball and trying to make a bucket, right? Yeah, I mean, especially if you compare, you know, Giannis was 5 for 11, so Giannis got to the free throw line a, a decent amount too, but didn't make him at near the rate that Zion did. I mean, I mean, he missed six, but he did make a bunch in the fourth quarter where it was critical that he make at least one, and a couple times I think he made both on his trips to the line in those situations. So, yeah, that, that, was, that was probably the biggest factor of why they were able to put it away and even though I think the Bucks got as close as four or five, maybe in the fourth quarter, um, after that the Pelicans were able to get a get it back up to where, with two three minutes left, I felt really good about the outcome of this game. Look, solid win, no doubt, and you saw some lessons apply, which is also a, a good thing here as well. And now you have Boston, who lost tonight to. Atlanta by a point, so they can't beat the Hawks. Lost the Hawks again, yep. Which is incredible, I Mm -hmm. guess, when you look at it as uh, the final score is 123-122. Look, you know what you're going to get with those teams here as well, Drew Holiday and all that? I want to bring up something Aaron Summers brought up when she went to the Bucks locker room. To uh to see if Damian Lillard was going to you know exchange jerseys with uh, with Herb Jones (laughs) when that was not going to happen. No, she mentioned to us several times the the men. the notion that the Pelicans were very physical on the defensive thing. The conductor, Chris, he, he loved it mm-hmm. because that's not normally our thing, and that's that's kind of what you're going to have to be. Is that part of the learning process as well, Jim, to understand that you have to be that physical team? Because I almost feel every time I hear that, it's Willie or a Pelicans player talking about why they didn't shoot the ball well because the other team got into them and was more physical. Mm-hmm. So I like hearing that tonight. Definitely. I mean, that speaks to – the aggressiveness and the mentality that they had, especially at the defensive end. So I think that was, that was huge. I didn't think that they were over the line physical. I feel like they were physical to the, to the proper degree. I mean, sometimes players on losing teams say that because they're frustrated Mm -hmm. and he might've been complaining about that from that standpoint. Um, But, but I mean, I thought there was an equal amount of physicality on the Pelicans defensive end when Giannis lowers, lowered his shoulder about eight consecutive times. I mean, that's just the way he plays. I like, I like him. I root, root for the Bucks sometimes, especially against specific teams that we're not fans of. But, I mean, it's kind of hard to watch your guys get knocked over like bowling pins and then have the other team say, like, well, you guys are too physical. It's called a basketball play, Jim. Mike mm. and Hoffer, I didn't know if you knew mm. that exactly. Okay. Yeah. At least according to Draymond Green, that's – what that is. I don't think we're going to look for legislation of basketball from wow, Mr. Draymond. That, but. that phrase, legislation of <laughs> basketball. Jim, it's always a pleasure when we have special guests, but it's even better when you have the conductor Chris Moran's fan favorite. I am told he not only has bed sheets, posters, homemade jerseys, 
You have no idea the love affair that our conductor, Chris Moran, back over at the studio has for Najee Marshall. It sounds a little disturbing, Mm -hmm. but no, I... Well, that's the reason that you sat down and chatted with him, right? Yeah. You know, actually, for the record, there was no... There was no demand from Chris that this interview be done. I'm not buying it. It was done on my own volition. You mm-hmm. know, I I had complete say-so in doing this. This was my call. It's an interview years in the making, by the way. It's not easy to sit down with Najee Marshall, is it? That's true. Yeah, he's a very elusive fella. <laughs> he is in there. A very special edition of Pelican's podcast here as we sit down. I'm sorry, not we. Jim Eichenhofer was granted access and permission to the legendary Najee Marshall, the knife. With my guy, Najee Marshall. Uh, Najee, wanted to ask you, today after practice, uh, Jose Alvarado was wearing, a ma- or during practice, he was wearing a mask, mm-hmm. and he actually joked that he wore it because he wanted to make you feel guilty that you elbowed him. Yeah. He, but he actually said that your response to seeing him wearing a mask was that it looked, it looked like it looked cool, it looked yeah. nice. What, what, what was, uh, what was the re- response that you had to that? Did you, did he was he just trying to just make you feel bad or what was the deal? Because he said he's not going to wear it during the game. Probably he just does lame stuff like that. But uh, <laughs> it did look pretty cool to be honest. I was imagining with the black jersey with it on. I think it would be pretty swaggy, you know. Everybody loves Jose, so whatever you do, he has a good game. That just be a new thing to him. Uh, face mask, Jose, something crazy. So yeah, um, I wanted to ask you too. Like I know you guys have been tight for it seems like since the day that he got here. What is it about his personality that, and you, you guys together, that made you guys become friends so quickly? I think we're just the same person. We have the same interests, um, same goals. Uh, I think we was kind of granted the same opportunity, being on a two-way undrafted. Um, kind of from the same area, um, same hobby. So it's just like we really twins for real. Um, a couple of people told me some things that, uh, that have been around the team, like on the road. One of the things that they mentioned – about you is that you seem to be the guy on the team that enjoys interacting with the crowd the most. Is that something that you you just get a kick out of, of like people that talk trash from the the stands that you you kind of enjoy just having fun with them during games? For sure, um, I just like having fun, and, you know, interacting with the people. Sometimes it's not all bad, you know. Sometimes people show me love and mm-hmm. I'm shouting them out, or sometimes. Even though they're talking trash, it's still showing love in a sort of way. So it just kind of gets me going, keeps me locked into the game. Um, especially when I'm engaging to the fans now, I got to be on my best. You know what I'm saying? Or else, you know, they win that battle. So, you know, it just keeps me locked in. It does it differently. Keep me locked in. Um, it's fun. You know, it keeps me fun. Make me not feel like I'm at work doing a mm-hmm. job. You know what I'm saying? So, And I know once my teammates see me doing that, they turn up too. You know what I'm saying? So it's multiple things that, you know, I do that. You know, that's the road games when, when the team is playing at home. Do you feel like it's you, you enjoy or you feel like it's important to get kind of just try to get the home crowd into the game and, like, get pumped, get them pumped up? Most definitely. Um, you know, my job on the team is kind of bring a spark anyway, so I feel like, you know, a little bit to my job to hype them up as well, you know, with the Lob, the Z, and Trey, and the Alvarado still. You know, I've been trying to get that this year, so most definitely. Um, people were telling me that oftentimes after games – Willie Green, instead of calling you Najee, just calls you Knife. Mm-hmm. What's what's your reaction to that as far as – it seems like it's a, a sign of respect that he, he just says, like, good job, Knife. Yeah, he knows what's going on. Um, <laughs> he gave me that nickname, and you know what I'm saying? And since he's then, I kind of lived up to it. So I think that, you know, that's just something we just standing on business. So Sure. You know, I was thinking recently that we didn't really get a great um, – Time, amount of time to talk to you about your background coming into the NBA mm-hmm. because your first year was completely like COVID restrictions and even mm-hmm. a lot of your second year was kind of that way where it was affecting how much like access the media had to the players mm-hmm. and how many interviews you guys could do stuff like that but I, I was wondering when you were coming up at what point did you start to think like I can play in the NBA was it when you were in high school was it before that when did you say like this might be a realistic thing for me um when I was in middle school, to be honest. But yeah. I really feel like that my whole life is cliche to say, but I just really never had no plan B. And to this point, as a grown man, of course I had plan Bs. Mm-hmm. You know, I went to college, stuff like that. But I, I really just never thought I'd be doing nothing else. I really just always thought I would be in the NBA, to be honest. When you, when you say that you have, as an adult now, that you have a plan B, 
what, what do you think are some of the things that you would be interest, most interested in, like, if you weren't an NBA player right I definitely now? want to coach. Mm. Um, I would love to coach any any level, AAU, high school, college. And I don't think I would want to coach in the NBA, but I would love to coach, give back. Um, I want to be a teacher. You know, that's really honestly mm. crazy. I really would love yeah. to be a teacher. Um, and it don't even have to be a crazy class. It could be a gym teacher. I just... yeah. I just, I just feel like um, I love to get back to the youth and I connect with kids. I love kids and they just, you know, they have genuine souls and I just mm-hmm. love to see that. And before they get into the real world, it's kind of crazy. You know, I would love to give them as much game as I can. So definitely something with children. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Yeah, you said that, you know, it sounds like you would prefer to coach, if you're going to be a basketball coach, to coach like a younger group of kids instead of maybe coaching the NBA is part of it just – from all of the stuff that you've learned, like all the stuff that wisdom and, and things that you can impart Facts. on them? I feel like coaches are important. They help shape kids' life and mental in a way because, you know, at times it's times where you're with your team and your coach is more than your family. So, mm-hmm. And you're that adult figure in their life, so they tend to you. And I've seen it kind of at every level. Um, I've been around people who've given me wisdom that I've used in life that I know could help some kids and that they just aren't getting and To be able to get that from a high-level person like myself, I think that, that's a gem right there. Um, going back to your background too a little bit, there I, there was an article in the Atlantic City newspaper that talked about when you came into the NBA um, that summer, which I know that 2020 was a, was a, such a weird. Mm-hmm. They said that uh, in the article that your mom your mom's uh, organized like a draft party for you. Yep. What was your was it the kind of thing where you were super disappointed that to not be drafted or how did you react to that? I was just like, damn, they f- up. Whoever 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 gets me is like, damn. Yeah. They missed on the gym right there, dominant and rough, but I already knew, like, from the gym, like, man. So whoever get me lucked up, man, to be honest, because I don't know. I just knew. I just had that feeling. Yeah, I mean, you've shown that yeah. in the four years now that you've been in the NBA Facts. that you should have been drafted. Um, how did you How did you sort through your options right away after the draft as far as you you had teams calling you? How did, how did you end up picking New Orleans and decide this was where you wanted to be? I think it was just a good spot. Um Looking at the roster, the players that they had at the time, just learning from them. Uh, even Stan Van Gundy as a coach, just being able to play for a coach who, you know, they had deep playoff runs and things like that. So I think it's just a good opportunity. I'm young, just trying to stick in the league. So guys like J.J. Redick, who was here, uh, Lonzo, B.I. and all of them when they first got here, Eric Bledsoe, James Johnson, those guys, you know, have the gyms that, I, they gave it to me to help me stick around and just stuff that's outside of basketball. So I was just looking at the bigger picture, kind of. You know, it's funny with Stan Van Gundy, because of the COVID season, I still never met him. Really? Even though he was here the whole year because everything was on Zoom. But um, he did praise you a ton. It seemed like mm-hmm. he gave you a lot of belief as far as he got. He gave you a lot of playing time. And he. it seemed like he really respected like your the way you played. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Did you kind of get that, that feeling from him that just like your aggressiveness – and stuff like that were the reasons why, at the end of that season, you got to play quite a bit. Well, definitely, man. I'm just blessed, honestly, because, you know, especially a coach like him, they don't give guys that type of opportunity. And um gave me a hell of a shot, which, you know, furthered my career. Um, so, I don't know, like, where I would be, honestly, if he wasn't my coach the first year. You know, maybe I would have never played. Um, maybe I would have got cut, whatever. But, he, was, like you say, he respected me a lot. I played hard. Played a lot of defense. That's what he liked most about me, I think. Mm. So, that helped me get on the court and showcase my, my total game, you know. So, yeah, yeah. I definitely owe a lot of credit to it. Yeah, Stanley I mean, I think you make a good point because there's a lot of guys in the position that you were in where you're on a two-way contract, and especially during the COVID season where you might not get as many opportunities. I, I mean, I think some guys did get more because of guys out of the lineup and stuff like that, but there's plenty of guys that never get a chance to play, mm-hmm. that never Facts. get to prove, and they end up playing overseas Facts. because they never even got, like, 15 minutes a game Facts. in the NBA. Um, last thing I wanted to ask you about your background that a lot of people have heard about how your dad was a pro boxer. Yes, sir. And they, I saw in an article that he had a bunch of, like, professional fights and stuff mm-hmm. like that. Um, did he – did you ever, like – do you, did you ever go through, like, training and stuff like that? Did, oh, Did he sure. ever show you, like, different things about boxing? For sure, for sure. Yeah, yeah I, I trained a little bit while I was younger. I moved from New Jersey to Maryland at a young age, but all the way up until I moved, I definitely was working on my dad and stuff like that. Yeah. For sure. Did did um the background that he had, do you think that 
impacts you in terms of like we've talked about your aggressiveness on the court like it seems like you are a guy that is never passive like you're always kind of getting in the middle of get, trying to get loose balls and, and just it seems seems like you always play with a ton of energy that's a big part of your game I think it's just who I am as a person yeah <laughs> it's just who I am as a person um I'm just a passionate person and um you know, I love basketball probably more than a lot of things in this world so just when I'm out there to get the opportunity to play in the NBA, just like unbelievable to me. So like, I just don't want to, you know, uh, look back on it and say I wish I did this. Mm-hmm. I wish I did this. It's just kind of leave it all out there moment for me. So yeah. How cool is it? I mean, four years. Do you ever think about like how cool it is like to have gone from where you know being undrafted to where you're a prominent guy on a team that is in fifth right now, fourth yesterday, but in the in the race for playoffs and in just such a good spot. Yeah, you know, like I never really got shell shocked about being in the NBA to like this year, like like you said, like just thinking about like how I'm drafted, how I'm undrafted to like it came up on the board the other day they said we was the number two bench in the NBA, and I'm just like like just to be a part of that like it gave me the chills for real because like 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 I said it's always the goal, but to actually be able to live it out and just do things like that and be a factor on the team, an NBA team, like it's crazy to me. Cool, appreciate it, man. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. All right, Jim, one of the things we love to do on our podcast, sir, and we'll get to that obviously here tomorrow, and that is going to be trending numbers. Yes, the trending number for this week is going to be one and two, and the reason I go with that. One and two. One and two, because the Boston Celtics have the best-ranked bench in the NBA, and the Pelicans have the second best. So I think that's an interesting matchup going into Saturday's game, the fact that I mean, this is, you know, one of the biggest tests of the season for New Orleans' reserves. We've seen them play so well throughout the season. Um, obviously, we don't know what Jose Alvarado's status is, and he's a big piece of what the bench was able has been able to do all season. But I'm curious to see how they do against Boston with a team that is, is up there in the rankings. And I think the Celtics are similar to the Pelicans in that they have a few guys that I think even, you know, casual fans maybe not even heard of but have been really productive Peyton Pritchard, Sam Hauser, Luke Cornett, guys like that. So that's the trending number because I, I think that's uh, going to be kind of an under-the-radar matchup. I'm sure all the billboards are going to have Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, Zion Williamson. Probably. But I'm looking at <laughs> Najee Marshall versus Peyton Pritchard. Well, it's interesting to, see, to your point, and I know Aaron Summers must have loved the powder blue, uh, was it a track suit that Dyson Daniels was wearing today on the bench? I love yeah, it. Yeah, that was interesting. Very UNC color-like. Yes. Um, we Look, we may see, he played really good in Birmingham. A couple steals, some three-pointers look good. I, I I would be thrilled to see him against Phoenix. I, I might have heard mm-hmm. a birdie or two say it would, they would be surprised if maybe you see hmm. it against Boston. But that, Interesting. that would be something as well, right, that and, you could see. And I think specifically, I mean, he's got to come back when he's ready to come back. Sure. But if he can play against the Celtics, that is a very good team specifically for him because of some of the big wings that they have between the couple of the billboard guys that I mentioned be, with Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown and some of their other guys. So that would it would be helpful to have him. It'll be helpful to have Dyson against Phoenix, too, if that's the game that he comes back with. Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, uh, Bradley Beal, the list yeah. goes on. Call Grayson it Allen. just in a nick of time, right? Say this again? Call it just in a nick of time. Yes, I mean, exactly. That, yeah, you kind of yeah. need those defenders. I mean, the graph and um, and J.D. talked about it during the broadcast. This stretch right now where the Pels are just facing, like, top three teams in offense, top, top three teams in, uh, you know, three-point yeah. shooting. You just mentioned the bench, their top three or, or the top. I mean, it's – all the top categories, offensively, defensively, these three teams, the stretch right here now, you've played two, now you're going to play Boston. It's just, and, and Phoenix is no slouch, but the point is, these three teams in a row, they're at the top of pretty much a lot of the categories. Yeah, and I mean, even more broadly, first, third, and fifth best record in the NBA this week between OKC, Milwaukee, and Boston. So, yeah, I mean, you couldn't have drawn up a much tougher, more difficult way to start this homestand, so... Fortunately, they're they're at least able to split these first two games. All right, we got no help yesterday, so I know what you love to do on Friday is do weekend showdowns. Can you break it up to Saturday and Sunday, or do you have one game in particular? I have, I do have one game. I I went to Sunday, and that is the Dallas Mavericks at the Houston Rockets Ooh. on Sunday at six p.m. And I mean, these are two of the hottest teams in the league right now. 
Dallas is putting heat on everyone that's in the top six or above them in the top six. And Houston is applying a ton of pressure to the Golden State Warriors with a 10-game winning streak. So um, that's the game I think that might be the most important for the Pelicans and maybe even you could argue the Western Conference during this weekend with two teams that are right in the thick of some of the heated races. And I know I've mentioned this briefly before, and I'll quickly say, too, that's a division game for Dallas, which affects the tiebreaker with New Orleans very directly. So there's another reason why people can say you you want to root against the Mavericks in every game. I think that probably goes without saying based on the race right now. But that one specifically is more important than some of the other games because it affects their division record and affects potentially the tiebreaker because the Pelicans and Mavericks split their season series two games apiece. Jim underscore Eichenhofer is the way to follow next. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks, Gus. Appreciate your time. As always, appreciate you for listening and tuning us in. We'll see you next time on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Thanks for listening to the New Orleans Pelicans podcast. Join us three times per week on pelicans.com, the Pelicans mobile app, the iHeartRadio app, or where you get your podcast. And be sure to give Jim and Gus a follow on X at Jim underscore Eichenhofer and GCAT underscore 17. We'll see you next time right here on the New Orleans Pelicans podcast.